You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. Um, my guest today is Del Tackett. Uh, he's a pastor and founder of the Engagement Project. I also saw him as, I guess, the head uh, protagonist, you can call it, on uh, uh, his Genesis History, which was a really fantastic, well, actually two two movies so far that are on YouTube and various other places that talk about, um, I guess I would call it maybe biblical geology or substantiation for God by looking at geology and at geological forms. So I'm glad to have him here. So welcome, Dal. Well, thank you, Rich. It's good to be with you. Yeah. Well, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get into uh, appearing in those films? And um, you know, I want to hear about your other work and pastorship too. Well, actually, I'm not a pastor, but my background is primarily in the sciences. So I, I have a degree in computer science, master's in software engineering and artificial intelligence, and then a doctorate in computer science and management and a retired Air Force started out flying and then ended up in Intel and, and uh, comm and computer. And then the Lord uh, basically, it's one of those times where God just, you know, grabs you by the scruff of the neck and change your directions. I happened to be at the White House at the time, and, and the Lord uh, broke my heart for the state of our nation and then broke my heart for the state of the body of Christ. And uh, so I knew I had to do whatever I could to get the body of Christ healthy. And so that began a whole new direction and chapter in my life. And that's where I am today. Oh, interesting. And then how did you interface with, um, you know, Thomas Purifoy and the people that made uh, his Genesis history? How did you end up appearing in that film or those films? Sure. Well, so Thomas and I just started talking uh, about about kind of the state of things. We were very, very concerned about what was happening, especially in seminaries. And uh, the loss of Adam and Eve, the loss of the notion of original sin. And so we talked about creating a film that was not going to be a film that was, you know, trying to tear down um, other views. It was a film that was going to try and present the evidence from some very, very smart scientists uh, that supported the notion that uh, you could read Genesis in the way it was written and you didn't have to have a PhD interpreted for you. Uh, so we decided to do that, and uh, we we had an incredible time doing both of those films. Yeah, so a lot of it was filmed in and around the Grand Canyon. Any anything that didn't appear on film that was remarkable to you when you you know when you were there and talking to the different scientists and seeing the features? Oh, there was a lot, as you can imagine. The, I think the film ran around you know an hour and forty five minutes or something like that, and you know when you're uh, spending several days with each of these scientists. And it, we, we were not only the Grand Canyon. I mean, we were in St. Thomas. Uh, we were up in the state of Washington. We were in Tennessee. We, we went a lot of way, a lot of places to be in the field field with these with these scientists. And so there were a number of them that just we just couldn't fit in the film. Uh, one was uh, talking with Dr. Larry Vardimer up at the base of, a, of Mount Shuxton, a big glacier in the background. We snowshoed back in there. The The other was just an incredible, incredible talk with Dr. Joe DeWeese about the Topar Isomeries in the, in the cell and the, just incredible, exquisite a complexity and design of of that inner cell. And so those, those did not make uh, the film. They were put in subsequent DVDs, but uh, they did not make the main, the original main film. So what was the experience like for you to go to these places? Um, you know, a lot of people that do anything in archaeology, they can maybe go to Israel or Jordan or places like that. But right here in the U.S., you were able to, <laughs> you know, see different things, but still that uh, things that speak to God's hand on the world. Sure. Well, you know, for example, going to Mount St. Helens uh, with Dr. Steve Austin and viewing the reality of what we know happened there. Or Dr. Steve Austin calls it uh, the Rosetta Stone for geology because we know exactly how those layers are formed. We know uh, exactly how that granite was cut 
We know how the canyon was cut uh, because we were able to observe it. And so we spent several days filming in, in that area. Uh, and for me, just uh, to be able to have the opportunity to be with these, these really genius scientists who are dedicated to their work and dedicated to the professionalism of their work. And so that was a delight for me. You know, my, my job is primarily to, to kind of be the interpreter because uh, sometimes, you know, the, the genius that resides inside these great scientists you know, sometimes can talk in ways that are difficult for the normal person to understand. So my job was, was basically to, to say, now, did, is this what you just said? And so forth. So I, I enjoyed it immensely. It was a lot of travel, but boy, I would I would do that again in a heartbeat. Yeah, one, so in particular with uh, Mount St. Helens, I believe it was said that when the explosion happened, a whole lake was blown out of its lake bed and, and moved mm -hmm. But hundreds of feet to the north, is that right? Like, how would you describe yeah. what happened? Well, what happened, this is Spirit Lake that you're talking about. And when the eruption occurred, what it actually did was uh, you splash. If you can talk about a lake splashing, the entire lake splashing up on, on the side of the mountain, which uh, basically scrubbed that mountain. And so all of the trees that were up there, it just basically you know, uprooted all of them. And then when the, when the water came back down into the lake bed, it came down higher than it was before just because of the eruption and the mud flows and all of that. And they thought uh, when the pilot was flying over that area shortly after, they thought that Spirit Lake was gone. Uh, but what they didn't realize was that this log mass, all of the, all of that timber it was now floating on the top of the lake, and you couldn't see the lake because of it. And so that, in fact, uh, I went there to Spirit Lake, and, and and we actually got on top of that log mass. It's still there after all of these years. Now, a lot of those logs have been saturated and have uh, sunk to the bottom and are being buried uh, just in uh, pre-coal layers, just like we see in coal layers you know, around the world. But they're being buried in, in the same way. But there's still a large log mass that's still on that on that lake, and the wind blows it from one end uh, to the other, I think, over time. You know it would be funny if there was a creature they called the log mass monster? <laughs> you know, that it, that wouldn't surprise me, would it? Someone would come up with, with a way to make that story. Yeah, but please continue, go ahead. So, so in particular, seeing that, what did that dramatically shorten the timeline of when that's been observed in other areas what was the assumed timeline versus the timeline of what we know happened i guess mount st helens erupted in what 81 i believe yes yes and there were subsequent eruptions there that that actually melted a glacier on the water just the that water and the force of water cut through uh, solid granite in in a matter of minutes and hours, and then cut out the canyon. A lot of the mud flows had laid down layers, just like we believe happened in the flood. All the sedimentary layers that we see around the world, and then that massive amount of water just cut out that whole canyon, as we believe now happened in Grand Canyon. So all of that happened, you know, within a mere minutes, geologically speaking, and all appeared in, in such a way that uh, someone might look at it and think uh, it took a long, long time, but it didn't. It was, it was a very rapid, rapid destruction and redisposition of, of material. What if you took uh, samples from the strata, you know, of the, the formations there, and you sent it off to a lab blind, and you asked them to date it, you know, date the strata, have you, has anyone tried that? And if so, what kind of data did they get back? I think there has been uh, there have been several attempts at taking rocks from layers that have been formed recently, uh, volcanic layers and so forth, and they come back with very old ages, and oftentimes they come back with very very disparate ages. And so what all that does is it just raises the question in one's mind that. You know, the way we date rocks is based on so many different assumptions uh, that uh, it should call that method of dating into question. Yeah, that's crazy. Hmm. I mean, where, what, what did you feel like when you were at the site of, you know, the former eruption, when you looked around <laughs> and saw these features? Like, what did, it, what did it do to your mind? 
Well, I want, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I remember standing up there looking at, uh, looking at Mount St. Helens in the distance and realizing that the ground I was standing on and all the layers in the canyon that were below me, the fauna, everything around me was younger than I was. And, you know, that, that struck me by how we can really be fooled sometimes in looking at things. You know, we're not usually fooled if we see a child. <laughs> so a child wouldn't come up and someone say, you know, this child's 180 years old because we have an experience associated with people and how they mature. No one would hand me an apple and say, this apple is 500 years old. So you know that you get really sick eating it. <laughs> But we have like, this uh, this Chinese food. In my fridge is three hundred years old. <laughs> I've eaten so, I've eaten some food that I think was several centuries old. But but the reality is, most things that we see around us, we have an experience uh, with them. Uh, even even a tree, you know, if someone told us there was a full formed tree that was eight minutes old, we, we wouldn't believe them. But when it comes to rocks and geological formations, we don't have experience with that, or we, we didn't until Mount St. Helens. And so it's easy for people to say, you know, look at the Grand Canyon and those layers, each of those layers was laid down over, you know, four, five, six million years. In some cases, there are millions of years between those layers. And uh, we don't have the experience in our lifetime to be able to say, you know, I don't believe that. Because someone has to tell you that, and the question is, are they telling you what is true? Now, I'm not saying that they know they're lying, but you know they have a mechanism that they use, and it's my experience, and that there is a motive for wanting to have deep time, because deep time allows you to do the impossible. So if you have enough time, you know, the rock can stand up and sing, happy days are here again. If you just... If you have enough time, non-life can all of a sudden become exquisitely complex. And But if you don't have that time, then you're confronted with a miracle. You're confronted with an act of God. And if people don't want to be confronted with that, then you have to maintain deep time. And you therefore have to see things in deep time. Actually, one interesting thing comes to mind. I have no idea if you could, if you could answer this, but... Can, because we, we see how fast things formed, you know, from Mount St. Helens eruption, can we tell when it happened? Like, if we didn't know, could we tell somehow that it happened in 1981 or whatever? Um, and consequently, with the Grand Canyon, can we tell, assuming that it happened very, very quickly, when it happened? So within a few years. Well, I think that's the point that uh, we don't, you know, unless we observe it, we have to use some some kind of a mechanism to try and recreate uh, not only how it happened, but when it happened. I believe that God has told us <laughs> when it happened and essentially how it happened, not not the details, so to speak. But from my perspective, you know, I've been, I've been a lot of places around the world, and I see these sedimentary layers. They look the same. In fact, there are layers that we believe are the exact same. The layers are not only found in North America, but they're found in Europe and so forth. And when we look at those layers, it seems evident to me and other people that those layers were laid down rapidly. Why? One, because there are fossils in those layers. And in order for fossils to form, they have to be buried rapidly, including uh, fish that are eating another fish or a fish that is giving birth to a fish. And uh, so they're they're buried rapidly. They weren't formed over a long period of time with a slow sedimentary disposition, a depositing. And so, but that doesn't, you know, there's not a tag on a layer that says, you know, this was made in this, this date. And so we really don't have good mechanisms that can date these things. Now, there is a scientific paradigm that believes the radiometric dating is 
is a good sound way to do it. I don't believe it, just simply because the assumptions that go into that dating are just too big. <laughs> the assumptions are too big. And when you have a motive for the answer to come out with long time, then that can bias uh, all of that. That's what's beautiful about Mount St. Helens, because we don't have to have a tag, you know, on the, the seventh layer in the Little Grand Canyon that was formed in uh, 1981 and 1982, because we know, you know, we have, right. we have the cameras, we have, we have the people who were alive and saw it and witnessed it and so forth. So, um, but I wonder if we could find a new way of, of using that experience and dating than the Grand Canyon or other, other events. It just might be very interesting to be able to do that. It would, you know, it'd need a new way of doing it, but maybe there's insight from Mount St. Helens. Well, and that's why, you know, Steve Austin calls Mount St. Helens the Rosetta Stone for geology, because uh, we should be able to interpret what we see around the world based upon what we see at Mount St. Helens. We don't have to guess how layers are formed. We saw how they were formed. The, the, the problem and the issue would be can you pinpoint how old those layers are? You know, because uh, a lot of it, you talk, talk about the red wall limestone or the Coconino sandstone, you know, those, uh, that material there was not formed from a volcanic eruption so that the rocks were formed as uh, and cooled as they, they, they were sand particles. And the sand particles were uh, ripped up, I believe, by uh, the huge global flood and a tsunami beyond anything you could even imagine, ripping up the ground, uh, forming huge, massive mud layers that are then rapidly flowing along along the bottom of the of the water and slowly coming to a stop and then basically over time solidified. So, you know, the, the question is, how do you go back and date that? You know, is this layer 6,000 years old? Is it 4,000 years old? Is it 100 years old? And so, but, but what we can do is we can talk about the witness that is given to us in the scripture that says that, look, the world was destroyed by water and it was formed by water in the beginning. It was destroyed by water. And in that a great flood, which, by the way, as an aside, virtually every people group around the world has a flood story in its in its history, which shouldn't surprise us. And from that, uh, be able to discern that what we're looking at, for example, in the Grand Canyon that has been carved out for us, and we're looking at those layers, that we can discern that the this is the remnant of that global flood. And you can see all those massive layers that lay down. You you can't really describe how those layers got there. We're talking about layers hundreds and hundreds of feet thick uh, by simply having particles sprinkled down in a placid ocean. It just uh, doesn't make sense. But a flood, like we saw at Mount St. Helens, does because it did lay down layers, uh, all of them hydrosorted and laid down and uh, and then carved out by massive water flows. So uh, we have the ability through Mount St. Helens to now say, hey, here is a mechanism that we know of, uh, and it looks similar to virtually everything we see around the world. Why not consider that all these layers are laid down catastrophically, and if there are canyons, they were cut catastrophically. So, yeah, that's amazing. I guess moving on to... Uh you know, some of the other features you saw. So I saw in one of the movies, I saw in one of the movies, uh, there was a rock that had, that had, it looks like it was curved and folded, yes. you know, at a, at a, a sharp angle instead of, you know, broken and jagged. What, what's the story behind that? Right. Yeah. This is in the second, the sequel to the original movie, uh, entitled the rise of mountains. And that's a little more technical movie. Basically, what we did is followed two uh, scientists as they were studying these folds, as they're called. We see these folds all over the world. And what has been interesting about those from a, from a perspective where one looks at the history of Genesis as a historical narrative, that these layers have been uplifted, but they haven't been crumbled. In other words, if you look at an earthquake today and uh, we see an uplift, it will crack. It, it doesn't bend, you know, so we don't have... Now, all of a sudden, no, oh, we got this little uh, little smooth uplift here. It cracks and it breaks, as we would expect. Rocks don't bend, but we have these folds that 
consists of multiple, multiple layers that, in according to the standard geological timeline, were laid down over millions of years, and in some cases, millions of years between each of the layers, the rocks had to have been uh, solidified when the uplift occurred, and yet they bent rather than breaking. And yeah, it looks kind of like a, like a folded Denver omelet or something. You know? it, it does. I, I look at like it was soft taffy, you know, that, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever had toffee, taffy lay around mm -hmm. and uh, it gets hard. It breaks as, as you would expect, but these layers uh, are folded and they're folded all over the world. And so the question is how in the world did this happen? Because it certainly looks as if the layers were soft but the standard timetable would say that that's impossible. But it is possible if the, if the record in Genesis is telling us that these layers were laid down rapidly one after the other, and then uh, we have a lot of tectonic movement and a lot of uplifting and so forth, while those layers are still soft, that would result in what we see. Now, what the scientists were doing and it's really remarkable, Rich. You think about this. No one ever went in to look at the at the granular level of these layers because the standard paradigm would say, well, they were they were bent because they were under a lot of pressure and a lot of heat, and those rocks actually metamorphed. Well, you can see there's a huge difference between metamorphic rock and limestone rock, and so they did. Uh, a very intense study on these layers and cut very thin slices so that you could look at them in a microscope. And the amazing thing was that they found the the little particles in there that show how the rock solidifies. You, you can cementation lines and so forth. Very fragile when they're looked at a, a in a micron uh, microscope, but they're not broken. They're not fractured. And so the, the conclusion has to be that these layers cemented after they were bent. They didn't solidify before they were bent. They solidified after. Yeah. And that is a remarkable, remarkable discovery because what it does is it, it basically says, look, the standard uh, paradigm associated with geological timetable is wrong. And it turns it on its head. Uh, so I was I was fascinated by that study, fascinated by being able to put that that film together and to talk with the scientists as they did that work. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, any any other features that really just knocked your socks off that you were amazed to see? Well, we talked about in the original in the original movie. Um, I mentioned earlier, Doctor Joe DeWeese who was talking about this mechanism that we found inside the cell. He was doing cancer research. And one of the things they discovered, it was a mystery in the very beginning when Dr. Crick discovered DNA, he and Dr. Watson, they knew that DNA held all the code for all of the pieces that the cell needed. So if the cell needed a new carburetor, for example, there was code buried down in the DNA somewhere for building a new carburetor. And they knew that the strand, the DNA strand, had to somehow be opened up in order for that code to be exposed. At the time, they didn't even really know how it was read, but uh, they pondered how that could happen. They thought, well, if you start to pull it apart in one end, then it's going to supercoil. And we'll, But now we know, and that's what Dr. Joe DeWeese was describing, that we have this this machine called the topoisomerase, and it somehow, and we don't know how, when the cell needs a new carburetor, I'm using that just as an example here, that this cell knows exactly where that code is. And it goes to the DNA strand and it clips it at the start of the code and clips it at the bottom of the code, pulls it out and unwinds it. And then the other mechanisms come in, read the code, and which is incredible, the you know how all that happens, and it builds a new carburetor, and it waits until uh, you know you get a good thumbs up that we got a good carburetor, and then it winds that piece back up in the right number of revelation revolutions, puts it back, and welds it the strand the DNA strand back together, and it goes away. It it was I just stood there with my mouth hanging open. But I was like, are you kidding me? This is this has to be along with a lot of the other things itself, it has to be one of those things where someone, if they are open, if their eyes are open, has to say, you know, this could not have happened by 
random processes. That, that is yeah. possible. So I interviewed um, one scientist. He had said that uh, the number of possible combinations of things that could happen in the human body was like 10 to the 70,000. <laughs> and I cracked up laughing because like the number of you know atoms in the universe is supposed to be like something 10 to the 80. Right. 10 to the 70,000 is so large, it's like beyond absurdity. It, it is. And I, I'll tell you, I, I mentioned I was doing, uh, I did graduate work in artificial intelligence. And back in the day, uh, we really were searching for a random number generator. And one of the problems was that every mechanism that we built to produce random number generators would eventually uh, repeat itself. And we'd have to throw it out. And the reason is because if if something is random, it do, it can't produce a pattern. Because as soon as it produces a pattern, you know it's not random. And, and yeah, you know, we look and we look at the, the human body, just the human body, and uh, look at the eye. You look at the digestive system and... To say a random, a random process produced order, that, you know, that's not, that doesn't equate. You can't even say that. But we have to hang on to the notion that random processes produced all of this given enough time because if we, if we don't, then we're confronted with a divine hand. We're confronted with creation. And if we don't want to see the divine hand, if we don't want to believe in a miracle, then we have to have deep time and we have to fool ourselves into saying that random processes can produce the most exquisite complexity beyond human imagination. Amazing. Yeah, one more thing about uh, you know the body is we all go through a stage where we're one cell. You know, sperm and egg combine into one cell and within yep. that cell is all the instructions to not only tell the you know the dividing cells which direction to divide in, which tissues to differentiate into. It's unbelievable the complexity. Imagine having all those instructions in something that tiny. Yes, it, it's just it's crazy. How could it do that? It has it instructions is. to replicate itself in the future, right? And and that is you know one of the most powerful evidences of of design is that that cell from the very beginning has to have all of the code and not only code you know from software engineering not only is there code there it has to be debugged it has to all be working and I uh, you know this reminds me that I remember when we were looking at some of the the fossils and we were looking at a, a T Rex and the skull of a T Rex. And uh, if you look at any skull, you will see these holes that exist along the jawline. And uh, it just dawned on me, I was looking at that, I said, what? <laughs> I don't ever think I ever asked, what in the world are these little holes all along the jawline? And what they are is when the, when the bone is being made, the, the little, these little machines that are making bone, not only do they have to know the length of the jawbone, the the angle of the jawbone, they have to know where to leave holes for the nerves because that's what those holes are for. The nerves have to pass through that jawbone. And when I first heard that, I was struck again by the complexity, the beautiful, exquisite complexity of what it means for uh, a living creature to be formed, as you just said, from one zygote. And you, you just have to stand back uh, in awe at that. Yeah, no, well, definitely. So once you had done these, uh, you know, these two movies, what, what did that do to your faith? It, it just reaffirmed it? Did it strengthen it? Like, you know, how do you feel today having seen all these things in person? Well, certainly from the standpoint of my faith, I went in believing uh, in the historical understanding of Genesis, but I, what happened was I was, I was confirmed that science, true science, uh, substantiate God's word, um, not that it needs it, but that truth is reality, and reality will never contradict itself. And so that's why we should never be afraid to look into the telescope. We should never be afraid to look into the microscope. We should never be afraid to look at the world around us because truth will always be consistent. The second thing, I'll tell you this practical, the second thing is that I cannot travel anywhere without looking at the layers. <laughs> and, uh, mm. 
my wife sometimes says, you're, you know, you're, you're fixated on these layers. Well, I know, but because those layers, uh, actually those layers represent the judgment of God. And I think that's what Peter was saying that, you know, there'll be a time where scoffers will arise where they were, the Greek says they will unwillingly notice that God destroyed the world with a flood uh, because God will destroy it again with fire. And so yeah. we don't like the notion of judgment, and we certainly don't like the notion of a future judgment. And so the scripture says that we willingly unnotice. Well, that the, the appearance of the consequences of the flood and the judgment of God is everywhere. You cannot go anywhere in the world without seeing it. And so you have to paper over it, or you have to come up with a different story. Yeah, well, and I don't remember her name, but there was a lady I interviewed probably about a year ago or less, and she studies planets and planet formation, and she's also studied the Earth. And she told me just in a passing remark, oh, there's, you know, there's quite a bit of water trapped inside the Earth. And I said, oh, how much, how much do you estimate? She's like, well, three to five times as much as there is in all the oceans and lakes and surface <laughs> water. So yeah. fountains of the deep, ding, ding, ding. Yep. That's what came to mind when she said that. I thought it was really cool. It's a, another, you know, I didn't take it any further with her, but it was a very cool corroboration in addition to everything you've seen and other right. things. Yeah, I remember yeah. calculating. Uh, I did. I took a film crew down the Grand Canyon one time. At the time, I was going to create a short film called Listening to the Canyon. That didn't happen. It hasn't happened yet anyway, but I calculated just the amount of surface water that we have today if the earth were a cue ball. There are no mountains or whatever, just a cue ball. <laughs> that there's enough water in the oceans to be over 5,000 feet thick all around the. And now that, that doesn't now include the amount of water which we now know is trapped in, uh, in layers beneath the surface. Which, as and I'm, I'm not refuting what she said, I, I would agree with it. I suppose I just don't know. But what did she say three, three times? Yeah, like three to five times as much as all the surface water in the, on the right, globe. Right, Yeah, so, you know, now now we're talking three to five miles above the surface of the earth. So that's a lot of water. And yeah. and what the scripture says is that, that the earth was covered in water in the beginning. And God is the one that used that water to form, uh, I think he used the water to form the dry ground, uh, pulverized it, created, uh, you know, rich earth and so forth. But that was before the flood. Amazing. So what, what future projects are you working on right now? Well, I did the, uh, a number of years ago, I did the Truth Project, uh, which really has gone all over the world, not because of me, 20 million people have seen it and more. I did a follow into that, the engagement project, which I think is the only way forward for the people, uh, people of God. And, um, so now I'm, uh, I'm just about finished with a book on the, on the resurrection and actually, I'm hoping I've, I've written kind of a partial script for a, another sequel to the Is Justice History called uh, The History of Climate Change. And yeah. what I'd like, like to do is help people see that, you know, when you get caught up uh, with a very, very short time frame, <laughs> looking just at a slice of, of Earth history, you can end up being fearful, uh, hand-wringing, heart-melting. Uh, and so forth. But if you if you look at the earth, especially from the standpoint of a creational view of the flood and so forth, uh, and the ice age and all the things that occurred, we've had tremendous amount of climate change. I would start that film standing on the Sahara Desert and say, you know, this used to be a very lush rainforest, that mm. uh, the climate has been changing in some cases drastically. And uh, what we see happening today is very, very minor compared to what has happened in the past. Anyway, so th those are, are there a number of things in the fire? We'll say, uh, we'll see. Okay, excellent. Well, Dell, this is great. There's tons of more things to talk to you about, but I, I don't have too much more time. What's the best way for people to start engaging with, you know, this material? I, I you go see, um, you know, his Genesis history and mountains after the flood. Any other resources for listeners where they can go further? Well, if they uh, just want to go uh, to the website, delltackett.com, we have a lot of resources there. The Engage Engagement Project, the Truth Project, the uh, Cross-Examine series I did, uh, a lot of articles on a lot of these things are there if it would be a benefit to people. That's how they communicate uh, with me. So delltackett.com. Okay, excellent. Well, Del, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a really great call, and I appreciate it. 
Well, thank you, Rich. It's been a joy being with you. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the Good Question Podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the Good Question Podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 